Without the trees, like pond, uh, ponderosa pine, ponderosa pine will associate with a, a uh, mycorrhizae called uh, Rhizopogon roseolus. And it roseolus has in a rosy appearance. Um, the, the fruiting body that it produces is a very beautiful little mushroom that is this crimson red cap. And that's why they call it roseolus. I don't think it's edible. I may be wrong. I'm not a. I'm not an edible mushroom person. You'd have to talk to Paul Stamets about that. You know, he he could tell you whether that was edible or not, but I can't. I only know it as its you know its botanical nomenclature and its taxonomy and what it does for ponderosa pine. But in order for us to really have success in in uh, in our soil nurturing, soil husbandry, pedogenesis, or whatever term you want to use is that we have to prime or instigate this process. And some of you are already doing part of it by introducing compost you know, to your soil, uh, but, the, but the full equation needs to be in place. And that means that we have to get the mycorrhizae back in there so that the mycorrhizae can feed the plants and so that the mycorrhizae can make this glomalin glue or protein and since protein is the precursor of humus, since protein is made out of amino acids, then it, it makes sense to us that the pipeline of humus formation must be coming from that glomalin. Because that is the most significant factor that's occurring in nature where protein is being made in the soil. It's being accumulated in the soil and it's being done by the mycorrhizae. Case in point, the most humus-rich environment that we can find on Earth is where? Or formally, where was it? The Midwestern tall grass prairies. Yeah, when the, when the pioneers came across, across those prairies, I don't know how they got across in the first place, because if you've ever seen a tall grass prairie, it's a jungle of grasses, big grasses. Mm -hmm. and, but they managed to get across, and so when they first started digging in the ground, what they found was this black, black soil and deep, in some, in some places it was 20 feet deep and black like that. So they promptly burned off all the grasses and started plowing it and farming it, and that's now the, what we call the bread basket of the world. Um, that's the best example I can show you, and the reason why there is so much humus there is because there was so much grass there. Going back to the lawn, why lawns are still good is because the most mycorrhizal intense environment that we can find anywhere on earth is on grass. Grass does it better than any other plant. Period. No comparison. Grass roots are full in a natural environment of mycorrhizal tissues and glomalin production. Wouldn't yeah. that be the same for like cover crops with grains, with grains falling, with grasses like rye or... Yeah, any, any grass, anything in the grass family, corn, sorghum, uh, oats, wheat, any of them. They all, they are what we call a mycorrhizal obligate plant. That means that they are obligated to have that relationship, and when they don't have it, they just don't do as well. They don't live as long. They're not as drought tolerant. You don't want to put too much down of any kind of fertilizer, whether it be organic or inorganic. Because if you do, you can actually hurt the soil rather than help the soil. So in my case, with the most stuff that we, we have, use it sparingly. I would tell you never use more than, oh, if you're using it by itself and nothing else is being applied, you could probably go up to 60 pounds per thousand square feet. That's all. If you're using it with other things like Yum Yum Mix and... Um, other organic uh, fertilizer programs, then you would probably limit it to only 30 pounds per thousand square feet. That's not very much, but it is a nutrient intense material, so you have to be careful about that. So back to mycorrhizae, we want to get that happening. We want to get mycorrhizae proliferating on the roots, grasses, and other herbaceous plants. Herbaceous are your non-woody plants. And many of your woody plants will use endomycorrhizae. The vast majority of plants on Earth use endomycorrhizae. There are a few 
that use ecto, a lot of your trees like oaks and pines and Douglas firs and blue spruces uh, will use ecto mycorrhizae, but most of everything else that you're going to be concerned about will use endo. And one species will do it all. Endo, the endo of choice is called Glomus interatensis. And it'll pretty much work with everybody, including most of the oaks. I just read this in a paper the other day, uh, where they were looking at oak trees in California that were dying from sudden death. And they were looking at the mycorrhizae on their roots, and they were finding that, uh, and I didn't know this. This was brand new information to me. They were looking at these trees and that the ectomycorrhizae were still there, but the endos were missing. And so they're wondering, well, maybe that's why this sudden death is happening. The endos aren't, aren't there helping the ectos do their job. And so the trees starving to death. They got weak. And then Phytophthora was able to kill them. Chili wilt. They're dying in chili wilt. And, uh, and I never knew that oaks even used endo. That was the first time I ever knew that. So I don't know everything. <laughs> Probably 75% of what I'm telling you is a lie anyway. <laughs> and the other 25% I'm not too sure about. But, yes, sir. Um, so, Michael, would it make sense to actually plant the seeds with that uh, rhizobia or mycorrhizobia with it somehow? The, um, well, in, in, uh, if you were a farmer and you were going to do massive amounts of land, and you had the ability to take your seed, whatever it is you're growing, corn, wheat, or, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. then it would be more log logical to, and more economically feasible to take the mycorrhizae spore mm -hmm. and put it in direct contact with the seed. Just like that picture that I showed you of the sorghum. Sure. Put it in direct contact with the seed. And then you'll get more bang for your buck. Because then you can take that seed and plant it and the chances of, it, of it inoculating that particular seed are better. Fortunately, it's fairly foolproof in that mycorrhizae do spread. Though they do it slowly, they will spread. So we have seen pictures of where farmers have done a, they had a line of demarcation, you know, where this side was, was inoculated, this side wasn't, the plants were one row apart. And within that first growing season, they can see an obvious benefit creeping over into the non-inoculated. It might spread the first season. It might spread one or two rows. I don't know if I can find it that fast. But it does spread slowly. It is unfortunately slow. So, uh, for example, at Mount St. Helens, which blew its top back in 1980, it hasn't yet gotten back into where they replanted uh, the forest of noble fir and red fir and all the conifers they want to have growing on that mountain. They have gone back in and re done some reforestation. But the, they've, gone, they've gone back and have checked to see if the mycorrhizae have come back in and they have not. So, um, and, and, and it has only spread uh, a short distance from the original blast zone where the blast zone took out the trees and superheated the soils. You, you, can, you can see where the trees here live, these died. And they've gone back in and looked at the mycorrhizal content, and it has only gone in like about a half a mile, you know, into the into the blast zone. So it's moving slowly. Twenty-nine years.